Methodist pastor, and I got an urgent text yesterday from Belinda saying, Charles had to go to the ER. He has acute pancreatitis. And um, could you preach tomorrow? I'm like, of course. So, um, but the choir I sing in is not singing today, so it worked out well. Um, Charles is doing better, but he's still not 100%. And so with um, Holy Week coming up, it's much better for him to stay home and rest. And that's why Belinda left, so that she could be with him. So I greet all of you. I greet all of you online and invite you now to listen to the prelude, and then we'll hear the announcements and begin our time of worship.
confession printed in the bullet. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the way of peace. Come into the brokenness of our lives and our land with your healing love. Help us to be willing to bow before you in true repentance and to bow to one another in real forgiveness. By the fire of your Holy Spirit, melt our hard hearts. Consume the pride and prejudice which separates us. Fill us, O Lord, with your perfect love, which casts out our fear and binds us together in that unity which you share with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now is the time in worship where we bring our joys and celebrations and our concerns to God to be lifted up in prayer. So, of course, the first one on my list is Pastor Charles. So, so what else do we need to bring to God this morning? If you raise your hand and then the microphone can come around so we can all hear. Thank that my brother-in-law and my sister are recovering well from back surgery, and thank you for Hedgie stepping in. Gracious God, we have gathered today, like the psalmist, declaring that we believe that we have walked in integrity. We also believe that we have walked in faithfulness, avoided hypocrites, and shunned the company of evildoers. We declare to you all of the good things we remember doing and saying and believing all week. But just in case our level of integrity is not the same as yours, we, like the psalmist, say, prove us. Place your steadfast love before us again and again and again, 
until we walk in faithfulness to you. Allow us to sit in your presence until we soak up your character and reflect your glory to the world. When we stumble, lift us up. Use us for your purposes. Grant us grace to keep trying. Help us to face the cross. We pray all these things in your son's name, and we pray the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our first two lessons today come from Mark and then Matthew, as Charles has been reading multiple versions of the same story for the Lenten series, so we continue today. First, from Mark. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray Jesus to them. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. So he began to look for an opportunity to betray Jesus. And then the second story from Matthew. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus in order to bring about his death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. He said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. Throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priests taking the pieces of silver said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury. They are blood money. After conferring together, they used them to buy the potter's field as a place to bury foreigners. For this reason, that field has been called the field of blood, and is so today. Then it was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah, and they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of the one on whom a price had been set, on whom some of the people of Israel had set a price, and they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord commanded me.
was just beautiful. Thank you. So our second gospel reading this morning continues um, in the Gospel of Mark, all of it in chapter 14, starting with verses 17 through 21. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. It is one of the twelve, he replied, who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. And then continuing in verse 27. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. And then finally, verses 66 to 72. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When he saw Peter warming, when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene, Jesus, she said. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately, the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. Well, as I mentioned before, Belinda texted me yesterday morning that Pastor Charles had to visit the ER and wasn't up to lead worship today. So I read the scriptures that he had planned to preach on, and I began searching my computer for a prior message that I had given about Judas and about Peter, so I could just kind of update it a little bit. And what do you think? In 10 years of sermons, the key words I searched for, Judas, Peter, Deny, and Rooster, did not turn up <laughs> any previous messages where I'd used those words. And honestly, I'm not sure if that says more about my preaching or about my computer skills. <laughs> But in my defense, there are chunks of computer memory and hard drives that have been lost over the years, as my laptops have failed for various reasons. And it's hard for me to imagine that my churches that I serve never heard about Judas or Peter, especially during the season of Lent. So, starting from scratch, under a pretty tight deadline, kind of looking for motivation and a shortcut, to getting a message written, my mind jumped back to memories of college English classes. Compare and contrast <coughs> these two characters. So after prayer and consideration of these two men, Judas and Peter, their actions and the consequences, I think that's a good place to begin. And then we need to ask ourselves, what do their stories tell us? about them, about Jesus, and about us. <clears throat> so in Mark's Gospel, the portrayal of the disciples is relentlessly <clears throat> negative, as one of my theological textbooks puts it. It's often been said that according to Mark, the only thing the 
disciples did right was to leave their nets to follow Jesus in the first place. Now, author Mark Allen Powell suggests that this gospel may have been written during a time of violent persecution, about 70 AD, 70 CE. And many believers had died in these persecutions. Some had felt compelled to renounce Jesus, and some were suffering in silence. And so Powell thinks Mark may have been writing this gospel to provide comfort and challenge to those folks who felt like failures or cowards or traitors. And for Mark, the cross is central to any true understanding of who Jesus is. And the fact that Jesus' original disciples failed may encourage us to remember this. We are not the only ones who mess up when we follow Jesus. And even when we do, not if, but when, God continues to love us and forgive us, and we can keep trying all the way to the cross. So what do we know about these two followers of Jesus? The Gospels don't tell us much about Judas aside from his betrayal of Jesus. But Judas's name is always last when the apostles are listed. <clears throat> and Judas was their treasurer. And according to John's Gospel, in chapter 12, verse 6, we're told that Judas was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. And the name Iscariot probably relates to the town where Judas's family was from, Kerioth, which is in the south of Judea. Now, as we heard in the first gospel reading this morning, Judas revealed Jesus's location to the chief priests and elders for 30 pieces of silver. Now, his motivation is described in scripture as greed or as the entrance of Satan into his body, depending on which gospel you're reading. And the final thing we know about Judas from Matthew's gospel is that when Jesus was condemned, Judas repented. He tried to undo what he had done, but it was too late. So according to Matthew, he went out and hanged himself. An extreme and final consequence to his failure, his betrayal. And when you look at Peter, we believe his family came from Galilee, but he lived in Capernaum, where he and his brother Andrew were fishermen, perhaps in partnership with James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Peter was married. We know that because Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law from a fever early in his ministry. And Peter's name was actually Simon. As we know, Jesus renamed him Kepa, K-E-P-A, which is the Aramaic word for rock, which in Greek is Cephas and in Latin Petros. Peter, the rock that the church would be built upon. So Simon Peter was one of the first, if not the first, of the followers that Jesus called. And Peter is with Jesus on several important occasions, the Transfiguration, for example. And even though other apostles are with them, like James and John, Peter is always named first. Peter is the one who knew that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of the living God. But in the next breath, almost, Peter argued with Jesus that he should never be killed. The crucifixion should, must never happen to him. Drawing a rebuke from Jesus that he had his mind on earthly things and not the things of God. And, as we heard this morning, Peter was certain, absolutely certain, that he would never desert or deny Jesus. Now, Peter has his ups and downs as a follower of Jesus. Peter seems to be a man of impulsive feelings and actions. Like when he blurts out this statement that Jesus is the Son of God, and when he promises he will not desert or deny Jesus. And yet, within a short time, just as Jesus prophesied, Peter denies knowing Jesus three times. And then realizing what he's done, Peter broke down and wept. Now Judas, I think, had questions about Jesus. His identity, his purpose, his mission. 
And the Gospel of John tells us that Judas spoke about caring for the poor, but also stole money from the collectors. <coughs> and in one of the Gospels, Judas is the one who condemns a woman for wasting costly ointment on Jesus that it could have been sold to help the poor. Could be Judas would have liked that money to be in a common purse under his control, available to him. And at times, I think Judas betrayed Jesus to try to force his hand. Because I think Judas saw Jesus as a Messiah, an anointed king of the Jews, a warrior king, in the tradition of Saul and David. And if he could make sure Jesus was arrested, wouldn't Jesus then summon all his power from God to free the land of Israel? Peter, on the, on the other hand, was always sure of things. Who Jesus was and Peter's own determination to follow Jesus all the way to the cross. Confidence, faith, pride, bluster, impulse. But then Peter would kind of second guess what he thought he knew. Jesus was the Messiah, but God forbid that he should be killed. Peter would never deny Jesus until he did. So how is it that both of these men heard the same words, the same parables, the same lessons and thoughts of Jesus and yet heard different things, different understandings? I think it's the same for us today. We all hear different things when we hear the words of Jesus. Now both of these men experienced remorse and grief over what they did and failed to do. So in these two men, in Judas and in Peter, we can see human failure. When forced to face the cross, the crucifixion, one betrayed Jesus, one denied him. And I think their common emotion was fear. Judas feared that Jesus would not act to raise a rebellion the way Judas thought he should. And Peter, I think, feared for his own life after Jesus' arrest. We have to remember that Jesus knew who would betray him. He tells his disciples at their last supper, their Passover meal, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. And the disciples are saddened, and one by one they ask him, Surely you don't mean me. In some translations, it's, Is it I, Lord? Is it I, Lord? Even Judas asks this, who knew he was betraying Jesus. And Jesus added, The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Even so, Jesus sat at that same Passover table with Judas and ate with him, giving him the same bread and the cup that he gave the other disciples. Now, God didn't cause Judas's betrayal of Jesus. I don't think that was a human act. That was fear, perhaps arrogance, that Judas believed he knew what God wanted, and that was Judas trying to help God along. But God used Judas's act of betrayal to bring the best possible result from it, Jesus' resurrection and our salvation. We hear that again in Romans 8.28. We know all things work together for good for those who love God who are called according to his purpose. Jesus not only knew who would betray him, he knew the disciples would all fall away. He quotes Zechariah 13, 7, when he says, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. And then Jesus says, but after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And as the disciples often do in Mark's gospel, they miss that last sentence about after I'm risen, I'll go ahead of you into Galilee. All they heard was you will all fall away. And that's when Peter, listed first in Scripture, says, even if all fall away, I will not. And all the others said the same. And we know what happened. They all did fall away. They scattered from the Garden of Gethsemane.
Gethsemane when Jesus was arrested and stayed away until the resurrection, with a few exceptions. Now, Peter follows Jesus at a distance, likely what he considers to be a safe distance, to the house of the high priest where Jesus is taken. And then he kind of hangs out in the courtyard, mingling with people, waiting to hear what will happen. And by that time, Judas is no longer with them. And three times people confront Peter about his having been with Jesus. And each time Peter blusters, he doesn't know what they're talking about. He doesn't know Jesus. So I think we can all imagine the fear that Peter feels. And then when the rooster crows the second time, Peter remembers what Jesus had said, and he broke down and wept. For, for all his pride and all his faith, he had failed his master. He had fallen away after all. Now the disciples were ordinary men, ordinary people, and even though they became heroes of the church in some way, it wasn't their own accomplishments that made them stand out. Certainly not early on in the story of Jesus and his ministry. We can definitely see that in Judas' betrayal and in Peter's denials and in the scattering of all the others. And yet, Jesus chose them. He called them. And yes, Judas killed himself after he repented. Was he forgiven by God? Was grace extended to him even after what he did? Now that's not something we have any way of knowing, at least not in this life, but I do wonder, what are the limits of God's forgiveness? Are there limits? I've been taught that there aren't, but betraying the Son of God seems like something that might be completely unforgivable. And yet, Jesus knew Judas would betray him and still fed him at that table. I believe that Jesus understood what needed to happen, what Judas would do, and had compassion. And that's the faithfulness of Jesus. After the resurrection in John's Gospel, Jesus meets his disciples at the beach in Galilee, just as he told them he would. I'll go ahead and you and get into Galilee. And he asks Peter three times if he loves him. Once for each time that Peter denied him. And this time, Peter answers in the affirmative without any bluster or pride or undue confidence. He simply says, yes, Lord, I love you, three times. Then Jesus instructs him, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep, with a final instruction, follow me. Peter is forgiven for his failures and given grace to try again to become the rock that Jesus named him. Just as Jesus called the disciples, it's Jesus' choice to call us. So discipleship is a relationship established by that call and by Jesus' faithfulness, not ours. Because we were frail, we fail, and yet, and yet, Jesus has called each one of us. And like Judas, like Peter, and like the other disciples, we keep trying. We continue to make mistakes, but we try to remain faithful to the call. And we continue to follow, even to the cross. May it always be so. Amen. Now I invite you to rise and bow your spirit and we'll sing hymn number 413.
morning. May we remember that Christ called us, not because of our faith, but because of his. May we remember that, yes, we may fall short, but we may still claim the freedom Christ gives us by his self-giving on the cross. May he enable us to serve together in faith, hope, and love, a charge to keep we have. Now may the God of love, who shared his love, strengthen us in our love for others. May the Son, who shared his life, grant us grace that we might share our life. May the Holy Spirit, dwelling in us, empower us to be only and always for others. Go in grace and peace to serve the Lord. Amen. Thank you.